The SEPA committee is meeting today to hear testimony on H.R. 2930, the STOP Act of 2021, introduced by myself, the discussion draft of the RESPECT Act, introduced by the chair of the full committee, Mr. Raul Grijalva of Arizona, and the ranking member, Mr. Dong Young of Alaska's bill, H.R. 438, to amend the ALSI Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolev Commission on Native Children Act to extend the deadline for a report by the ALSI Native, uh, ALSI Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolev Commission on Native Children. Under committee rule 4F, any op oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help keep members to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Hearing no objection, so ordered. As described in the hearing notice statements, um, documents or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository HNRC docs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that with as in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. Uh, we will be, for opening statements, we will, to, uh, for the effort of trying to preserve time, uh, we will have the opening statements address each of the bills. I will begin by recognizing myself for the opening statement on the STOP Act. Um, good afternoon. Uh, the legislative hearing will be on three bills, H.R. 2930, the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony, or STOP Act, the discussion draft of the requirements, expectations, and standard procedures for effective consultation with tribes, or RESPECT Act, and H.R. 438, which will amend the L.C. Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolev Commission on Native Children Act to extend the deadline for report by the commission. Uh, I am grateful. Um, to have introduced H.R. 2930, the Stop Act of 2021, with my good friend, Ranking Member Young, as well as Representative Sharice Davids and Representative Tom Cole, the co-chairs of the Congressional Native American Caucus. This bill will utilize existing federal laws and definitions that protect tribal cultural heritage items. To do this, H.R. 2930 prevents the export of items that are already classified as illegal contraband within the United States. The U.S. is already a signatory to an international treaty that enables the federal government to support the repatriation of other countries' travel objects. However, while we have stated our intent to protect important cultural sacred objects in the United States, we don't have a statutory mechanism to prevent them from going overseas. My bill establishes the necessary tools to secure international repatriation of tribal objects. Throughout history, Native American cultural items such as human remains, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony have been looted and sold to collectors in our country and abroad. Just one example of this illegal behavior comes from the Pueblo of Acoma in New Mexico, and we will hear from the Acoma governor. In the 1970s, a sacred Acoma shield was stolen during a robbery on tribal lands. In 2016, the shield surfaced at the Eve Auction House in Paris when it was scheduled for sale. An outpouring of diplomatic pleas against the auction house came from tribes, executive branch officials, and members of Congress. Although the sale was stopped, incidents like this will continue to occur without measures that hold those who traffic tribal cultural money accountable. And to be clear, there are likely many more cases of tribal cultural patrimony thefts that go undiscovered and unreported. While I am proud to introduce this bill, I know it is the product of many years of hard work before me. The bill was adjusted to accommodate concerns of the antiquity dealers, over 20 amendments. These changes include the additional of mens rea, which refers to whether individuals know their actions are illegal as it relates to implementing export penalties, self-attestation, meaning self-certification, rather than requiring a higher evidentiary burden to support an expert certification application, a burden of proof required for object forfeiture and the process that items are returned to exporters after the seizure. 
The STOP Act of 2021 was drafted and developed in close negotiation with tribal leaders, federal agency experts, and those who earn their living selling legal tribal art, including the authentic Tribal Art Dealers Association, from whom we will hear today as well. In summary, the STOP Act gives tribes, pueblos, and nations a tool to close the door on the illegal exportation of cultural objects. Provisions of the STOP Act are designed to keep tribal cultural objects where they belong, with the people who revere them and consider them a part of their belief system and way of life. We must facilitate the return of those precious and essential items that have been removed illegally from tribal lands. The bills before us offer an opportunity for this subcommittee to work together to acknowledge the importance of honoring the sacred nature of Native American patrimony, of acknowledging the government to government relationship and of protecting Native children so that they may thrive. Um, I will now recognize uh, ranking member Obernolte for his opening statement regarding uh, ranking member Young's bill. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for convening the hearing on some very important topics uh, regarding protecting the rights of the indigenous peoples of America. Uh, ranking member Young, I know, wishes he could be here. Uh, his bill is a very simple one to uh, extend the a deadline for the report from the Commission on Nat uh, Native American Children. Uh, I think that that bill is uh, very straightforward and certainly worthy of support. Uh, and the other two bills, I think, are very worthwhile bills that we're hearing today. Um, I know that these bills have opposition, but I am in hopes, Madam Chair, that uh, a compromise can be found because it seems like the opposition is not unreasonable. And I think that the goals of the bills are extremely noble. Talking specifically about the STOP Act, uh, I think that uh, it is... Uh, uh, past time that we act to uh, strengthen regulations against the illegal export of Native Amer American artifacts uh, and also to comply with international treaties that uh, other countries have enacted that would strengthen the international network against the illegal export of those objects. Uh, we certainly cannot let those objects uh, be past the rule of law once they get past the borders of the United States. Uh, I think, however, that we also need to respect the right of people to legally export uh, Na Native American uh, art and uh, cultural objects uh, that, that the tribes do not object to the export of. And uh, for that reason, I think we need to be very careful that there is a defined time frame uh, that, uh, that governs the certification of legal exports. Uh, I think that the people who want to uh, legally export should be allowed to do that and that they should have some surety in uh, the time frame for uh, being granted an export certificate for those. And also the RESPECT Act, I think, uh, has uh, a very important and noble goal, one that I very much support, uh, the goal of allowing consultation with tribes when decisions are made by the federal government that affect them. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's actually deplorable that we don't have a formal definition of what tribal consultation means. This is what the bill is uh, attempting to do, and I, I fully support that. However, if we are going to uh, add some specificity to this, I think we need to make sure that we are very specific and uh, that we avoid the ambiguity that's in current law. So uh, I, I'm hopeful that uh, as the bill moves through the committee process here, that we can make sure that we do that and, and be very specific about what we mean when we say we're going to consult with Native American tribes. So I'm looking forward to the, forward to the hearing, Madam Chairman. I yield back and uh, thank you again for convening the hearing. Thank you so much. The chair would now like to rep recognize Chair Grijalva for his opening statement regarding the RESPECT Act. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for the hearing and for including uh, uh, the RESPECT Act, my legislation in, 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 in this hearing. It's a discussion draft and uh, to follow up on the ranking member's comments, uh, because I, I think that the, that the issue, as you and I have discussed, is, is a paramount importance in terms of uh, not only a definition, but of the relate, trust relate, uh, relationship that uh, our nation has with uh, with sovereign tribes. And, and, and that is enshrined in statute, treaty, uh, precedent, and uh, legal precedent, and the Constitution. And so, but one of the issues, as you well know, and, and many of you, is, 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 is the, the 
persistent complaint since I've been in Congress and I've been there longer than most people would want me to, <laughs> the, uh, that since I've been in Congress has been the lack of consistency uh, and, 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 and the lack of formality and, in, in, in the consultation process. And, and, and so, and that has come from Indian country. And I think the goal of the respect act is simple and straightforward, effective, meaningful tribal consultation as a matter of law. Uh, this has been a top priority of myself, but also I think of many people. Uh, and, and the bill originally came out of uh, a frustration that I just in, uh, indicated and the obstacles that tribes have faced when it comes to agency actions that affect tribal lands and interests. It came out of conversations I had with tribal leaders over the years, where I heard of the issues that arise between tribes and the federal government when tribes are not respected as sovereign nations. The Congress has never established standards for federal government, how the federal government is to follow, uh, uh, what, what they should follow when it, it takes actions that affect tribal communities, despite the fact that this is part of that trust responsibility I, I mentioned earlier. The current lack of uh, a uniform framework has, in a, has a myriad of uh, consultation process uh, instead of a uniform, uh, a unified framework. Each different from agency to agency, and the process is even more cumbersome with mul when multiple agencies are involved. And the fact that tribal consultation is embodied solely in executive order means that the implementation of the process is spotty at best and especially as administrations change hands. Uh, far too often, federal agencies have already decided on the course of action and the consult with tribes by simply notifying them of that action. Much of the confusion and conflicts that exist between the federal government and the tribes can be traced back to, to a lack of clear guidelines for meaningful consultation. That is why I think uh, the respect that is cr critically needed. The legislation is a combination of our many discussions with tribal leaders, stakeholders, uh, legal experts, as well as uh, and those legal scholars had great input into the draft discussion as well. Uh, and this is uh, the product of what we think is the best approach to tribal consultation. And certainly, Madam Chair, uh, open to uh, additional uh, comment, critique, and recommendations as we go forward. Uh, the RESPECT Act sets forth detailed procedures for the timing, format, implementation, and documentation of executive agency consultation with tribes. It requires agencies to take proactive approach to dealing with tribes, to do real outreach, and, uh, other, and deal and prepare for uh, a, a document of dealing with tribal impacts before an action uh, is taken and before any process can begin. And it necessitates that the consultation process is robust and allowing time for real meaningful collaboration and discussion. It protects sensitive tribal information, uh, such as sacred sites, religious practices, and instructs agencies to recognize and respect uh, that tribal sovereignty. Uh, finally, it provides judicial recourse for tribes when federal agencies fail to fulfill the consultation obligation under the law. And, uh, I think it, it reduces project delays. It helps avoid legal battles. It helps fulfill the legal obligation of the federal government. And those are some of the lasting, I think, benefits of this legislation. I look forward to the discussion today uh, from our witnesses and their comments. And again, Madam Chair, thank you so much for holding the hearing and for including my legislation in, in the mix. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Thank you so much, Chairman Grijalva. Now I'd like to transition to our panel of witnesses for today. Before introducing, I'll remind uh, them that uh, we are encouraging you to participate in the Witness Diversity Survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, and that is in your materials we provided to you. Under our committee rules, uh, oral statements are limited to five minutes. Uh, but you may submit, and we have received and read your longer written statements for the record. When you begin, the on-screen timer will begin counting down. It will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I re recommend both members and witnesses joining remotely to use the grid view so they can lock the timer on their screen. When you go over the allotted time, I'll gently uh, ask you to wind up. 
After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise, and I will allow the entire panel to testify before we question the witnesses. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Brian Bio, who is the governor of the Pueblo of Acoma. Governor Bio, for five minutes. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Young, and members of the subcommittee. I am Brian Vallo, and I'm the governor of the Pueblo of Acoma in New Mexico. Thank you for holding today's hearing on HR 2930, also referred to as the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony, or STOP Act. My testimony shares Acoma's perspective on why the nonpartisan STOP Act would be an invaluable tool to advance federal protections for tribal cultural heritage items for present and future generations. Our Pueblo has developed an expertise in federal export and repatriation law through our continuing fight to end the illegal trafficking of our cultural heritage, particularly overseas. Among our most recent battles was the effort to return a ceremonial shield that was stolen from our community in the 1970s only to emerge on a Paris auction block in 2015. We worked tirelessly with federal allies, including our congressional representatives and agency officials to negotiate with the auction house an individual consigner on its return. The effort was eventually backed by federally led litigation and a warrant. Despite such broad support, however, we were informed by France that without an export prohibition and export certification, no help could legally be provided to us. We were deeply frustrated because there exists, in fact, an international mechanism for the cooperative repatriation of cultural property, and the United States and France are both parties. However, the benefits of the United States participation in this mechanism face outward rather than inward. The Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property is an international treaty that facilitates import controls on the repatriation of cultural property. It lets one signatory country request that another signatory prevent the import and facilitate the repatriation of its cultural property. However, the treaty requires countries to first enact domestic law prohibiting export of cultural property and create an accompanying export certification system. The United States implemented part of the treaty per the Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act, through which we repatriate covered cultural property to other countries. However, the United States has not enacted a domestic law to protect cultural property originating within the United States leaving tribal cultural heritage items unprotected by the treaty. To extend this protection, we need domestic law containing an export prohibition and export certification system for such items. It was because of this omission that our ceremonial shield took years of costly negotiations to eventually come home through voluntary return. The STOP Act would allow the United States to benefit from the international repatriation me mechanism by enacting the domestic laws necessary to use it. Through the treaty, tribes could more easily secure international repatriation of items that are already protected in the United States. The STOP Act would require exporters to apply for and receive an export certification from Interior for NAGPRA cultural items and ARPA, Native American Archaeological Resources. The act would thus use definitions that have existed and have been upheld under federal, federal law for decades. It would explicitly prohibit the export of covered NAGPRA and ARPA items only when these laws already bar such items from being trafficked. In our Pueblo's experience, preventing the export of protected items in the first place dramatically increases the chances of their recovery. The Act's export prohibition and certification process would limit export of federally protected cultural heritage items. It would also allow for tribal monitoring of export certification applications so that tribes could flag protected items for the interior. 
Further, the STOP Act would create a framework to facilitate more seamless dialogue and action between the, and within federal agencies. Often, tribes receive very little notice ahead of an option, and they must mobilize multiple federal agencies, offices, and bureaus to halt the sale. Finally, the STOP Act would create a voluntary return framework to encourage and help those wanting to return tribal cultural, cultural heritage items to tribes. We are encouraged by Congress's continued focus on this important issue. And the Pueblo of Acoma stands ready, along with numerous allies in Congress, Indian country, and beyond, to work with this subcommittee to pass the STOP Act. Tawana, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Governor Viro, for your testimony. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Stacy Leeds, who is a professor of law and leadership at the ASU Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Uh, professor Leeds. Madam Chair Fernandez, Chairman Grijalva, and members of the committee and subcommittee, it's my honor to present testimony on the discussion draft of the RESPECT Act. Osio Nagata, Stacy Leeds, Dawado, Jijalagi. Hello, everyone. My name is Stacy Leeds, and I'm Cherokee, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. My current academic home is Arizona State University, and I'm Law Dean Emeritus at University of Arkansas. And I come to this subcommittee with two perspectives. First, as a former commissioner on the National Commission for Trust Administration and Reform, and second, as a teacher and scholar on Indigenous legal issues. The National Commission on Trust Administration and Reform that I served on with four other commissioners was created in 2009 by secretarial order to address the Department of Interior's trust management after the Cobell Settlement Agreement. As most of you will recall, Cobell was a class action lawsuit regarding the United States trust responsibilities. And the commission worked for a two year window from 2011 to 2013. We received volumes of written submission and conducted face-to-face -face listening sessions all over the United States so that we could convey the on the ground experience from the broadest possible spectrum inside of Indian country. Secretary Salazar charged the commission to broadly evaluate the Interior Department's trust management of nearly $4 billion in Native American trust funds and then at the end provide a comprehensive report uh, with a set of recommendations. We delivered that to Secretary Jewell in December of 2013, and that report's a matter of public record, which I will link in my final written remarks, which will be submitted for the record. If the RESPECT Act is passed, it would be implementing one of the express recommendations of that commission. As an introduction to the express recommendation, I'd like to briefly quote from the report. The overall theme presented to the commission is that the federal government as a whole needs more firm direction as to what the trust responsibility is, and that is an obligation to be carried out by every federal agency exercising authority affecting Indian interest, not just the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the agencies within the Department of Interior. Although the commission was very complimentary of many of the enactments of Congress and policy statements that have been made over time from the executive relating to consultation by all federal agencies, the commission found that appropriate consultation was still lacking in many individual cases that were disclosed to the commission. One subsection of the report is uh, directly relevant to trust consultation and tribal consultation issues before the subcommittee. And the findings of that commission relative to consultation are threefold. First, when federal agencies prepare to take action they must that affect the rights of Indian tribes or their members, they must consult with the affected tribe and tribal citizens to inform their decision-making process. Second, although there are a myriad of consultation policies and directives that have been enacted in prior legislation that require consultation, those are limited in their scope to impacts on Indian historic, cultural, and religious sites and should be more broad in their scope. And finally, there have, has been good efforts and some progress to deploy consultation as a tool for implementing federal trust responsibility one example that stuck uh, was the tribal realty employees. They possess a wealth of knowledge. They do the work at the tribal level, a wealth of cultural knowledge as well. And it was suggested that they be used more to inform the work of federal employees. Their expertise is critical to meaningful on the ground consultation. And it punctuates how consultation needs to happen at all levels, especially in the trenches. The commission unpacked many situations where Indian interests are not adequately considered and when requests by individual Indian nations and individuals for action or information 
were not accepted. In conclusion, the commission's express recommendation on consultation are twofold. First, federal officials must establish clear protocols for disclosing and minif minimizing conflicts of interest, which should be implemented after full consultation with Indian nations. And this goes beyond conflicts that meet minimum legal standards applicable to non-fiduciary relationships. It should also extend to appearances of conflict of interest that affect tribal and individual interest in any action related to trust assets or the government to government relationship. Second, and most relevant to today's topic, the commission recommended that the administration must work on Indian nations um, with Indian nations to develop a judicially enforceable and uniform consultation policy to be codified in federal statute. I'll end by flagging two um, issues for the subcommittee as the bill makes its way through the committee process. First, although in the draft there are prescribed timeframes for delivery of communications at the consultation stage and for public comment, there's a lack of defined time period for what constitutes good faith efforts. And as it relates to good faith efforts in sustained interactions for the tribes, an agency can conclude that no further tribal consultation will be productive, but there's no time frame assessed for that. And then finally, I ask that you would consider how this consultation process applies to individual allottees with trust assets. As we know from Cobell, the federal government owes a trust responsibility to these individuals as well as to tribal governments. And while I acknowledge that technically that falls outside of the nation to nation framework, the scale of Cobell was extensive and yet the lessons that we learned in that process are not necessarily fully addressed in the current draft. Other than those noted issues and suggestions, the bill does a good job at establishing enforceable minimum threshold requirements for the consultation process. What up? thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Leeds. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Matthew Fletcher, who is a professor of law and director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center at Michigan State University, and who has the incredibly useful Turtle Talk uh, blog, which so many of us read. Professor Fletcher. Uh, miigwech and, and bonjour to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for asking me to come, uh, Madam Chair. Fernandez, uh, Chairman Gahalva, Ranking Member Westerman, Member Gallegos, uh, other members of the subcommittee, it is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I came to you two years ago to talk about an earlier draft of the RESPECT Act, and uh, uh, my testimony then and uh, today will be hopefully to help supply uh, some of the legal, historical, and political background and framework for uh, the uh, obligations of the United States government to meaningfully consult with Indian tribes and other tribal interests whenever there is a federal project that uh, may implicate those tribal interests. Um, I fully concur with those who have already testified before, uh, most especially uh, the um, um, uh, Congress member Gallegos and also, of course, Professor Leeds uh, for uh, 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 justifying the uh, continued obligations of the United States in this respect. Uh, I believe the RESPECT Act is a very powerful step toward fulfilling that obligation. Federal tribal relations always work better as a partnership of sovereigns instead of as an adversarial relationship. Many Indian nations believe that the relationship between the United States and, them and, the, and their nations is one of a familial relationship. It is not intended to be adversarial. The RESPECT Act is one of the few statutes that uh, gives true meaning to that relationship and the meaning and the depth of that relationship. Our current era of federal Indian policy, as, as it has been for the past half century or more, is that of tribal self-determination. And for that period of time, Congress and the executive branch largely have embraced this relationship. Uh, the Congress and the executive branch and the United States has also embraced the trust relationship and the duty of protection that the United States owes to Indian people and to Indian tribes. As Justice Sotomayor noted a few years ago, in every significant Indian affairs statute of the past several decades, Congress has acknowledged the trust relationship and even stated that it is enforceable upon the United States government. Uh, it is no surprise that many Indian tribes thrive under the self-determination policy of the United States. It, is a, it was a long time coming in the 1970s when the United States firmly turned in that direction. 
but there is still more work to do. Uh, at times, the old era of guardianship and paternalism, where the federal government made unilateral decisions in Indian affairs or other decisions that affected Indian tribes, um, is usually a relic of the past, but at times uh, it, it rears its ugly ed. Uh, happy to talk about examples. Uh, in, in the Great Lakes area, where I'm a citizen of the Grand Traverse Band of Chippewa Indians, which is a signatory of the 1836 Treaty of Washington. And we are currently looking at a, a, line, a pipeline that runs underneath the Straits of Mackinac, which is at the confluence of three Great Lakes, uh, the largest freshwater bodies in the world. Uh, there is a pipeline that runs along the bottom of the Straits of Mackinac that is aging, uh, is archaic, and incredibly dangerous. And in fact, it is a existential threat to the tribes who are the of, of the Great Lakes area. I'm also happy to talk about the Back 40 Mine Project, which is located on, near, it will implicate the uh, Menominee River, which, which straddles the border between Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, I also want to talk, of course, and my, as my testimony does, about the RESPECT Act itself. A few years ago, I suggested that the RESPECT Act should um, more clearly and specifically uh, mention res respect for treaty rights. And I was glad to see that there is um, outstanding language in this draft that incorporates that uh, recommendation. Uh, I was also happy to see that there is a uh, uh, that I also, I two years ago, I testified about the impact that state governments can have on the federal tribal relationship and on tribal interests, and how state governments uh, struggle, I think, even more than federal government in terms of uh, acknowledging its obligations to consult with Indian tribes. And I believe that this, I recommended uh, two years ago, and I believe this draft uh, incorporates language that suggests that states must meaningfully consult with Indian tribes when uh, engage in an action, a federal project. Uh, finally, uh, I wanted to highlight that uh, a, a wonderful achievement, I believe in the, this draft, the notion of a tribal impact statement, which seems to be in my initial reading, a parallel to the environmental impact statement that we hear uh, about in the National Environmental Policy Act. I think this is also a very interesting and worthy discussion topic. And hopefully when Congress passes the RESPECT Act, this will incorporated in the final draft. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fletcher, for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Ms. Laura Van Schiffgaard, who is director of the Tribal Legal Development Clinic at the UCLA School of Law. Ms. Schiffgaard for five minutes. Gwadzi, hello. Thank you, Madam Chair Lega Fernandez, Chairman Grijalva, members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to comment on this discussion draft of the RESPECT Act. Uh, thank you also to Governor Bayo for your tribal leadership. My name is Lauren Van Schilfgaard. I serve as director for UCLA's Tribal Legal Development Clinic. I'm also a tribal member of the Pueblo de Cochiti and uh, was raised in Albuquerque. The RESPECT Act is a novel, comprehensive codification of the federal government's obligation to meaningfully consult with tribal governments. This is critical both symbolically and substantively. The desire to strengthen federal tribal relations through consultation has permeated federal policy for at least the last half century. Yet the implementation of federal tribal consultation is currently clunky. There are instances in which federal agencies have no consultation policy whatsoever. They have wildly inconsistent policies and or practices from other federal agencies. They might fail to follow their own consultation policies, but there are no accounted accountability measures. They might treat consultation as merely a checkbox procedural requirement, regardless of actual tribal engagement, such as initiating consultation after all the relevant determinations have already been made, or conflating tribal interests with those of the general public. They might perceive consultation as a one-sided event in which the federal agency solely develops the agenda, limits engagement to one meeting, or restricts the flow of information. They might treat consultation with one tribe as satisfying consultation with all tribes for all issues. 
Critically, because consultation has never been comprehensively defined or codified, tribes have minimal statutory relief to compel federal agencies to engage in consultation or hold them account accountable when they fail to engage uh, in consultation meaningfully. The results have been disastrous for tribes. It's resulted in reactionary and adversarial posturing and has been immensely costly for tribes, but also for the federal government and for the greater American public. Despite the lack of codified consultation requirements and expectations, consultation with tribal governments, when conducted meaningfully, is nevertheless the most effective and efficient means for acknowledging and braiding tribal concerns into the vast array of projects and interests that impact tribes, including, but also beyond, environmental and cultural resource protection. Consultation is a manifestation of the nation-to-nation -nation federal tribal relationship. It can facilitate large-scale resource management planning, incorporating tribal concerns early and thereby limiting costly and harmful intrusions later. It can be an effective and trusted mechanism for addressing unforeseen impacts. It's good federal governance and it's good tribal governance. Moreover, meaningful consultation has been identified internationally as a tool of good governance. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples calls for nation states, including the United States, to consult and cooperate in good faith with tribal governments in order to obtain their free prior and informed consent, including before adopting and implementing legislative and administrative measures that may affect them. Ideally, and what the RESPECT Act calls for through a detailed floor of consultation expectations, all federal agencies should have a robust consultation policy that necessitates tribal input regarding the development of agency management plans, especially regarding landscapes that include sacred places, provides meaningful notice of potential impacts to tribal interests as early in the process as feasible provides ongoing communications regarding developments in a project, allows for a range of consultations in form, substance, and length, depending on the needs and expressed desires of the tribe, provides a mechanism for tribally initiated communications, does not conflate tribal nations or their interests, consolidates consultation notices and format internally and across agencies to minimize the flood of disparate notices and processes that tribal nations are facing, considers and protects the confidentiality of tribally sensitive information, including tribal uh, traditional knowledge, and finally, institutionalizes this nation-to-nation -nation relationship that seeks tribal input and consent. Bawa'e, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair now recognizes from my state of New Mexico, Mr. Robert Gallegos, who is the treasurer of the Antique Tribal Art Dealers Association. Mr. Gallegos, for five minutes. So now speaking on behalf of Atada, the largest organization of native American tribal and international ethnographic art dealers in the U.S. Atada is at the forefront of ethical collecting and art dealing. Not only is our membership prohibited from selling sacred items, we found the first we founded the first and only voluntary return program in the U.S. Our educational work in the community has raised public awareness of the importance of safeguarding Native American cultural heritage. Our program has returned over 300 truly sacred objects to the Pueblos and tribes. Next month, 20 Navajo masks, 12 Hopi masks, and one Apache mask will be returned. This program has continued to build trust and to gain acceptance in the collector community and, the, and in the Pueblos. The time is right to work with people on education because people are very aware of the past harm to tribal communities. Solutions agreed to between the communities based on trust and transparency are the only meaningful ones that will pass the test of time. We are concerned about the bill's effect on our industry. We're also concerned that enacting a punitive and overbroad law will jeopardize 
the trust between our communities. There is a lot that Tata agrees within the goals of H.R. 2930. We should ban the export of illegal items, require documentation of commercial exports, provide for trackable attestation of legality by exporters, utilize existing export processes to facilitate compliance, have a time-limited user-friendly cert certification process, especially for lower value items. Use the certification regime to facilitate the repatriation of illegal items. Limit descriptions of items, of types of items requiring certification to respect the sacred or the secret nature of ceremonial items. Here are the harmful provisions of STOP that the committee should amend to make the bill work. It should not put the entire burden of proof on the exporter. The lack of provenance of 90% of items is in effect a de facto export ban. The bill should use a knowing standard to ensure due process, not a should have known standard requiring vague due diligence which threatens law-abiding citizens with criminal prosecution. H.R. 2930 creates a new export regime in the Department of Interior from scratch. We should use the existing AES custom system. There is no consultation with the industry for regulations governing that industry. In a previous 2018 bill, an agreement with ACMA had been reached on using an existing custom system. The bill places no time limit on review of applications for export certification, serving as a bar to commercial transactions and scheduling of traveling exhibits. It provides for unchallenged tribal rights to review without adequate funding or oversight, but at the same time gives tribes unchecked authority to ban any and all exports. The vague language does not make clear what happens to lawfully owned items claimed by the tribes. It blocks transparency by making all tribal communications on certifications exempt from the Freedom of Information Act requests, denying due process and making appeals and challenges impossible. There should be reasonable time limits and an effective means of appeal, and we should not criminalize unintentional violations. It will require every tribe to set up a system to respond to applications without adequate funding. Only $3 million is provided to establish this system among approximately 600 federally registered tribes and Hawaii organizations. Millions of Americans who own artworks and crafts created by Native American artisans will be affected. It will inevitably depress markets for goods made by thousands of Native American artisans, past and present, tainting legal artworks and harming the interests it purports to, to, to protect. Atata understands the need and supports the passage of this bill. Native communities need an international standing to deal with cultural issues so distasteful European auctions will not ever occur again. However, our hope is that this bill is constitutional and fair. Anything less will provide, will prove to be detrimental to all parties. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to voice our concerns. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallegos, for your, tes your, your testimony today. Uh, I thank all of the witnesses for their testimonies. And I'm going to remind members that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on our questions. The chair will now begin recognizing members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. And I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. So we know that the STOP Act and the RESPECT Act are similar but not exactly the same, right? They're meant to address different issues, but they have the same concern regarding the concept of tribal consultation and of protections uh, that the tribes deserve for both their cultural patrimony and for other impacts that they may have from federal action. 
So with that in mind, I want to enter a number of letters from tribes across the country in support of the STOP Act, including from the Hopi tribe, the United South and Eastern tribes, the All Public Council of Governors, the Happy Montelol Pomo of Upper Lake and others. Uh, so those are admitted uh, uh, into the record. Governor Bayo, in your experience, could you share with us how do objects of tribal cultural patrimony make it into the international markets? Madam Chair, um, Chairman Grijalva and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the question. Um, in our public experience, many of our cultural objects began the path to international markets through theft or their illegal removal from the community. Under Pueblo law, sacred and culturally significant objects belong to the Pueblo uh, under the guardianship of caretakers who cannot legally uh, sell them or physically take them away from our community. When items are lost through theft or sales, uh, many entities play a role in their in subsequent trafficking, whether intentionally or not and individual, individual consigners, auction houses, and appraisers are all involved, among others. <clears throat> the STOP Act would end this pr practice by creating a means for centralized monitoring of attempted exports through the export restriction and certification system, as well as by facilitating robust federal tribal cooperation on the issue of, rep of repatriation. It would also explicitly criminalize attempted export of items already prohibited from being trafficked domestically. Uh, we need this dual approach to trigger the anti-trafficking treaty and to prevent items from moving over the border and out of our reach in the first place. And uh, further, the STOP Act would also increase penalties under NAGPRA as a deference. And, and Governor Byro, you described how that your attempt to not just recover this shield, but other items that have been lost, uh, improperly lost and illegal. And I think that it's important to mention that, that we're talking about those things that are not entered into the market um, because there is a robust market for uh, the our tribal artists, but that these are those that are illegally taken. You talked about how costly and expensive it is and that that Akuma has actually become a leader in this, but that it is costly and expensive. Is the STOP Act going to provide assistance to maybe a tribe that might not have the resources, uh, a smaller tribe, to be able to protect its patrimony? Uh, thank you for the question, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, the STOP Act would provide uh, the mechanisms um, that we need to ensure that um, these items are protected and are not uh, continue, uh, export, exported and, and illegally trafficked. Uh, this is a costly, costly and timely um, or, or time uh, involved uh, activity. Uh, for smaller tribes, it really places a great uh, pressure on us <clears throat> to locate and identify resources to support this work. By having a policy and having in place, uh, this would allow for uh, small tribes who, um, some who don't have the resources to engage in this effort, uh, the opportunity to work directly with the federal agencies and the interior to ensure that their items are, are, are addressed. And that when those opportunities are there for items to be returned through this process identified in the STOP Act, <clears throat> excuse me, it provides that process, a streamlined process uh, for all tribes. But for s small tribes who don't have the resources, this will be uh, just a valuable uh, tool for, for them and all of us. The Pueblo of Acoma spent uh, years um, uh, to retrieve the ceremonial shield, um, a great investment on the uh, financial investment on the part of the tribe and while we do not place monetary value on any items, um, they are all seen as, uh, as patrimony, as significant con con contributors to our culture uh, and our life way. Um, unfortunately, at the end of the process uh, where the shield, uh, ceremonial shield was concerned, 
there is a price and it's tremendous. Thank you, Governor Bayou. Um, I would also uh, quickly turn to a quick question because my time is on is up. Uh, Ms. Van Schildgaard, why is, even if we didn't have a clunky and we had a president committed to the uh, consultation process, why is executive order not enough? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, uh, we have an executive order that President Clinton issued in 2000, Executive Order 13175, that um, really established and, and is what we base our consultation on right now. And it's great. It, it like these policy declarations help move the needle, set the tone. Executive orders are, of course, not acts of Congress. They can be uh, revoked by a subsequent president. It's also true that the uh, executive order from 2000 is vague. It does not provide the detailed expectations that we find in the Respect Act. And now, 21 years later, from that thank executive you, order. Thank you, thank you so much. We will also submit that and seek it. Uh, it uh, your, the remainder of your answer in writing. Uh, Absolutely. I, so I would uh, now recognize ranking member uh, Young uh, for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, I first would like to thank you for taking up my bill, HR 438, which would amend the Alice Spotted Bear and Walter, Walter Soboloff Commission on Native Children to provide additional two years for the commission to complete a report as required by Congress. I'll submit the rest of that statement on that bill with the unanimous assent, if you agree. <laughs> okay. And the uh, second one is I'd like to ask some unanimous consent that the uh, Alice Spotted Bear and Walter Soboloff Commission on Native Children's Statement uh, on H.R. 438 be included in the hearing record. So ordered without objection. And again, Madam Chair, thanks for this hearing. I think it's crucially important on the Stop Act, especially. And Governor uh, Vail, in your time advocating for the Stop Act, have you found it has, it has been broadly supported? Uh, thank you uh, for the question, Representative Young and uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Yes, absolutely. The Stop Act has bipartisan. Uh, co-leads and uh, co-sponsors, um, and has many tribes and tribal organizations urging its passage. Um, it also has many non-tribal organizations uh, in support of, of the act. Uh, the, the STOP Act uh, passed the Senate in the last Congress by unanimous consent, and we understand that on the House side, the bill was cleared for passage by all three committees to which it had been uh, referred the White House also signaled support of the bill last year. Um, this year, the House Ways and Means uh, Committee has already informally cleared the bill, uh, bill's language. And the current language of the STOP Act reflects the outcome of careful negotiations. It has incorporated extensive formal and informal technical assistance from multiple federal agencies. Uh, and, and so, it, yes, absolutely, sir, it, it does have um, uh, great support. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate your participation. All the witnesses, I've been on the floor. I don't know how the Madam Chairman got back to the committee as quick as she did, uh, but uh, congratulations on both. All three of these bills should be pretty much um, non-controversial. We'll work for, through them with the leadership of the Chairman, and the witnesses have testified, so I do appreciate it. And Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ranking Member. The gentleman yields. The Chair will now recognize uh, Chairman Grijalva for five minutes of questioning. Again, thank you very, again, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Professor Leeds, uh, in your written testimony, you, you mentioned your work uh, with the National Commission on Trust uh, Administration and Reform and those recommendations. And uh, can you, and, and you mentioned those recommendations as you, as you were going through it. The, and and it was intended to solidify Obama administration's trust responsibilities to get that item as an important item. Can you elaborate how the RESPECT Act uh, would fulfill the important finding of, of, of consultation? You mentioned it in your opening testimony, and maybe just to reiterate that point. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman Grijalva, um, Madam Chair, and I now see Ranking Member uh, Westerman, my former colleague from Arkansas. Thank you, sir. Um, Chairman, the, um, the testimony that we heard during those two years um, on the commission frequently came back to these questions of consultation. Um, we heard many examples such as, you know, databases that were supposed to be accessible to tribes um, that were never uh, data tested with the agencies that would actually be using those. Um, we heard many examples, um, and I mentioned this point of um, the individual electees, in addition to the tribal governments themselves, that are entitled to a trust responsibility because they're owners of trust assets. So a number of the uh, recommendations were around both those individuals and the tribal governments themselves. Um, but you're correct. In the final recommendation, there were a list of um, express uh, requests for statutes uh, to be addressed in this area, and the consultation was key. Um, we noted that there were two or three other uh, cases that were filed around the same time as COPEL, where it was impossible to set forth any trust responsibility remedies because uh, the rules that were prescribed were only for um, agencies uh, as part of the executive order 13175. And so unless those are codified in statutes, um, there's no means of enforcement. And it in fact, disincentivizes those agencies to have rulemaking around uh, consultation because it can only be counted, uh, yeah. held accountable um, if it's expressed in their own rules, sir. Thank you very much. And, and, and the two points that you made in terms of uh, this, 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 this draft of uh, future legislation, uh, they're, uh, they're taken uh, for, for uh, good information and we'll follow up on some, some questions we might have regarding some of those. Thank you. Uh, uh, Director Van Schiffgard, did I get it right? You nailed it. Oh, wow. Uh, I have the same problem with my name. It's got too many vowels in it. Maybe get all that. Anyway, uh, your testimony acknowledged uh, how National Historic Preservation Act and Native American Graves and Protection and Repatriation Act uh, have established some precedent for tribal consultation. Why, why aren't these statutes enough? So, so that's right. We have some codified consultation requirements in the National Historic Preservation Act, in the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, uh, also in the National Environmental Protection Act. But even amongst those three acts, the consultation requirements are either incredibly vague or and or they conflict with each other. Um, they're also incredibly narrow in scope. The National Historic Preservation Act arguably provides the biggest consultation hook for tribes, at least in an act of Congress. But even there, the, the scope is a historic property. Under the Section 106 process, and specifically under Bulletin 38, we see some administrative and regulatory expansion on what a historic property can include, but it's still not centered on a tribal resource. And okay. so the RESPECT Act is going to provide a an expanded scope for what demands consultation, but also provide a uniform consistency across federal agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to follow up with written questions to, to the other witnesses, but I appreciate this, uh, this opportunity and I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields. Uh, the chair would now like to recognize our ranking member from the full committee from Arkansas, uh, Representative Westerman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for uh, having this hearing today. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. And Dean Leeds, it's it's good to see you. Uh, I don't know why you abandoned us in Arkansas, but you know we once in Arkansas and we we claim you always there. But uh, you know, as we we look at these important issues. Uh, Mr. Gallegos, you claim that uh, there is no time limit for review on export certification. Can you go into some more detail on how that could possibly be problematic for your members? <clears throat> 
Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for that question. Um, a lot of the businesses um, that were a lot of the uh, the forums that we participate are often their shows. A good example would be um, the America uh, the um, the Indian market in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and often our customers come for like a three or four day period. So if commercial items are included, and I'm speaking basically about contemporary commercial items, not possible sacred items, uh, then what happens is, is if the process is too lengthy, the buyers are not going to buy because they're going back home. And so it really has to be fairly prompt and uh, and predictable, something that we know and how to use the system. So it would it would uh, mean loss of sales, essentially, and that it would hurt not only dealers, but it would hurt the artisans. So what do you think would be a reasonable uh, amount of time for a review? Well, I would think uh, one week would be reasonable, and then if there's kind of like an issue uh, that the uh, native elders identify, then we can have an extension of time, maybe 30 days to to figure it out. But it's uh, I can only see that problem in the contemporary market if maybe some of the local artisans uh, put a design on either a weaving or a piece of pottery that has sacred implications, and they probably did it unknowingly, but that's going to be, uh, that's going to occur very little. And and I know a lot of the uh, Pueblos are teaching and informing their tribal members, particularly the artisans, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So I think the time limits although sometimes it's too fast in the view of our native communities, it, it would work because the, the uh, contemporary items is a category where we're gonna have the least offense, offenses. Governor Fio, in your opinion, what uh, would be a reasonable amount of time for review? Thank you for the question, <clears throat> uh, Representative. Um, the Stop Act directs Interior to issue regulations within one year um, of enactment, and it directs the Interior to include a reasonable, in quotes, <laughs> deadline by which the Secretary shall approve or deny an export certification application. Uh, any tribal consultation that takes place uh, before issuance of the certification must happen within the Interior confines of the Interior's process, and thus within its deadline. So uh, I respectfully defer to the federal agency um, with regard to the deadline it will create for itself. However, I would say that I imagine that some items will receive a certification quite promptly and others may uh, require some time to review. Thank you. And uh, Dean Lee, I may have mis misspoken, but are um, where are you currently uh, working? What's your current position? I'm the Foundation Professor of Law and Leadership at Arizona State, so Chairman of Grijalva's territory now. <laughs> yeah, I knew I knew you had that association, but uh, I didn't know if you still had a connection with uh, with the Razorback Nation out there. Only a house still in Fayetteville, sir. <laughs> well, I'm sure the value of it's going up every day. So, thank you for being here, uh, Madam Chair. Are you back? Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Representative Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this important hearing. In Southwest Florida, in the city of Northport, it's known to have many archeological sites within its city limits. It's home to there in the surrounding area, the warm mineral spring site. The first Native Americans arrived there between 12,000 to 15,000 years ago during the Pleistocene period, Pleistocene period, forgive me, 
During the Ice Age, a time when Florida was cooler and drier and giant mammals like mammoths roamed across our state, it's hard to believe. We already know it's already illegal to dig up as well as to buy, sell human artifacts from Native Americans or from Native America or federal land. But as recent as 2019, looters were collecting items in the Mayakahatchee Creek. Bill Goetz, a local historian, explained what's found underneath this creek are valuable artifacts that date back to the first Native Americans, but they're supposed to stay here. Large holes could be found all along the bank and underneath the surface, evidence of looting. They're literally digging holes in our history, said Gates. These wet sites really preserve a lot. These people were not preserving anything. Obviously, with their excavation techniques, they were just causing damage. Illegal trafficking in culturally sacred tribal objects and artifacts is still a real threat in Florida and across the nation. That's why the STOP Act is so important to enhance protections of Native American artifacts, uh, and that's why we're supporting it here today. The RESPECT Act is in that common theme that uh, Chairwoman Ledger Fernandez was talking about, that trust, that input that is so critical uh, for the United States government uh, in conjunction with our Native American tribes. The RESPECT Act is critical to codifying tribal consultation for proposed projects and regulatory action to ensure meaningful input, meaningful input. Mr. Uh, Fletcher, your written testimony provides background on the treaty era of U.S. history and how it established the modern day understanding of the federal trust responsibility to federally recognized tribal governments. Given that you testified for us last Congress, in your opinion, would the revised Respect Act discussion draft help ensure that the federal government lives up to our trust obligations? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Congressman So I'm happy to say that I think it's a big step forward from the previous draft, which was already a big step forward. Uh, treaty rights really are the origin of what uh, the, the, the Supreme Court once referred to as the duty of protection, which is the origin of the current modern day understanding of the trust responsibility. It is the relationship between Indian tribes and the United States. As I said before, from the tribe's perspective, or from many tribes' perspective, that is a familial relationship. Even if we look at it merely as a governmental relationship, um, I think it's fair to say that if you look at some recent opinions from Justice Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, you'll see that um, at least some uh, justices on the court believe that, uh, understand that what Indian tribes gave up um, in, uh, in seeking a relationship that, do, uh, that is a trust relationship with the United States is vast and extensive. Um, there are tribal interests that go, that definitely include treaty rights, but they go further than treaty rights. Indian tribes negotiated for a homeland, they negotiated for a permanent relationship uh, with, with the federal government. And and um, the RESPECT Act goes a long ways into acknowledging that there is this ongoing relationship. Um, thank a consultation you, is just a small my part of that, but thank you. Forgive me, my time's no limited. Uh, Ms. Van Schilfgaard, uh, based on your experience, do you believe that passage of the RESPECT Act would help build trust between tribal governments and federal governments like Mr. Fletcher was talking about? Yes, I totally agree. I think consultation achieves a lot of objectives, the, the matter at hand that's being consulted, but also in building the trust between the consulting parties. So by establishing this codified floor of expectations, both parties can enter consultation with stronger expectations about what's going to happen, what we're going to achieve, and how we're going to get there. I think it's a win-win. Thank you so much, Mr. Fletcher. I have 10 seconds left if you want to supplement your answer. No, that's fine. It's uh, what I was going to say is my written testimony. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Thank you so much. The chair now recognizes Representative Obernolte for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all of our witnesses. This has been a really interesting and important hearing. I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Fletcher. Um, one of the things that uh, I think we all agree on is the need for more specificity when it comes to talking about uh, when what tribal consultation means. And 
it, it seems to me like the Respect Act could be improved with that in that sense because uh, some of the uh, ambiguity still remains in the bill. And I'll give you an example of it. Uh, when you talk about how the bill defines tribal impact, the, the, the definition is any federal action that may have an impact on one or more tribal governments, which to me seems really broad. I mean, you could make an argument that any federal action could conceivably have an impact on tribal governments. And that kind of ambiguity drives me crazy because it essentially abdicates our responsibility as a legislative body to say exactly what we mean, and it, it punts it to the courts. So now the courts are going to be arguing about what, what tribal impact means and, and whether or not a federal action may have an impact on a tribal government. So do you share that concern, and what can be done to make that more specific? Thank you, Mr. Congressman. Um, I, I analogize it to the en environmental impact uh, statement language from the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, it is very broad, but keep in mind that the relationship between Indian tribes and the United States is also very broad. I mean, all of the land that we reside on, certainly here in the Great Lakes, is treaty territory. It is territory that Indian tribes ceded to the United States in the 19th century, but that, re that tribes still retain interests in. Um, I also think that um, the, the, note, the tribal impact statement, the where, it, where it is situated in the bill, is that where it's situated in the process, the proposed process, uh, early on is actually a very good place for it. Um, it forces the agencies to think about uh, what the potential impacts might be. And, um, you know, I can easily see that uh, if they find none in the early process, then that's a good step. Right now, what you have is uh, situations like in here in Michigan, where tribes like the Bay Mills Indian community, my own tribe, the other 1836 treaty tribes have to deal with multiple state and federal agencies, plus international agencies like uh, uh, the US, uh, that between the United States and Canada. Um, that each one of those agencies has its own separate consultation process. Each one of those agencies makes usually makes a determination without talking to the tribes initially um, on whether there is an impact. This would sort of consolidate all of that mess into one place. And I think that would be a dramatic improvement. Okay, but I mean, surely we're not suggesting that if a tribal government uh, can argue that a federal action could conceivably have an impact on them that are they're allowed uh, they're allowed consultation. I mean, we've got uh, uh, things that that I mean, uh, energy prices, right? That has an impact on tribal governments because it increases poverty when when energy prices go up. So, an uh, an action of the federal government to uh, to you know regulate to require renewable energy, for example, that could conceivably increase energy prices. Is that something that tribal governments would expect consultation on? Absolutely. Tribes in the Upper Peninsula um, depend heavily on uh, imported energy, I mean, especially in the wintertime. Um, and that's actually a thing that is at issue in, uh, in the Line 5 matter, which is uh, had consultation occurred earlier and on a much broader level, uh, the Upper Peninsula tribes and other, other, also Northern Wisconsin and Minnesota tribes that are impacted by, uh, by the energy that is carried by Line 5 would have had uh, the opportunity to make suggestions on how to improve that uh, chain of commerce. Okay. Well, I mean, I, th I think this is something we need to continue to have dialogue on because, uh, you know, I think I think we need to be specific about exactly what it is we mean by tribal impact. And then I... Do we lose? Yeah. Mr. Obonelti. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm still here. <laughs> Great. It froze for a little while, so you have about an extra 10 seconds because you froze. Oh, okay. If you could continue. Uh, if I could ask a, a question of uh, Mr. Gallegos, uh, you, when you were answering to uh, Congressman Westerman's question uh, regarding the potential impact of the STOP Act on commercial uh, art sales, um, you, you indicated that it might have an impact. Uh, could you expand on that? Because clearly we're not trying to regulate the sale of a newly created piece of art by a tribal craftsman, right? I don't think that was the intention. Oops. Thank you. I don't believe that's ever been the intention, although the wording does allow that to happen. And, and I would just say that 
to correct the problem, just eliminate commercial items made for commercial purposes altogether. But uh, yeah, it'll it'll when you don't know the process and and you don't know whether you're going to be convicted of uh, improperly uh, exporting or not getting an export permit. You, we just don't know these things. So it's going to, once the word gets out, it's going to hurt sales in the industry. And and I'm more concerned about the artisans that will be affected. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I, I see my time's expired, but uh, certainly as a discussion we need to continue to have. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Obelnuti. Uh The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Ruben Gallego. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and, and thank you to our witnesses. Thank you for being here to testify, Professor Leeds. I'm proud that ASU has uh, one of the preeminent Indian law programs in this country, so it's fitting that you're here with us today. In your testimony, you discuss an Obama-era commission recommendation underlying the need for legislation like the RESPECT Act. Can you expand on some of the reasons that current guidance or lack thereof makes it hard to ensure that every agency, agency is upholding the trust responsibility? Yes, thank you, Representative Gallega. Um, the, the recommendations dealt with the lack of statutory clarity and enforcement issues. And um, when you look at the limited um, scope of prior legislation, it always seemed to address issues like NAGPRA, access to sacred sites, and um, issues around historic preservation but it stopped with those types of subject matters. And all the other types of consultation that have been mentioned here today would fall outside of those enforceable consultation uh, processes. Um, as some of the other witnesses have, have testified, um, when it is left up to individual agencies to have their own individual policies, they've got a choice to make either go through the rulemaking process and have specific guidelines that then make them accountable under their agency rules or simply remain silent and follow the executive order. And as I mentioned before, I think a lack of statutory um, guidance like the RESPECT Act incentivizes that last option, right? Because so long as they haven't taken steps to spell out what consultation means for their agency, they could never be held accountable for not consulting with tribes. And that was the concern that we just heard repeatedly during the commission's time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Schilfgaard, the Respect Act mandates that a tribal impact statement is transmitted to tribal governments by their relevant agencies. In your opinion, why is the Respect Act's mandate of a tribal impact statement critical to the consultation process? Yes, thank you. I think um, to reiterate Professor Fletcher's point, um, having a tribal impact statement provides transparency. It also provides notice early in the process about what some of the potential in impacts are. And so that provides more open communication earlier on. It also provides accountability for the tribe to ensure in case something is not in that impact statement that needs to be. Um, critically, past consultations, I think even with good intentions, treated consultation as this checkbox, we just need to go through the motions. By having a tribal impact statement, it injects more of the mutual decision-making process to have legal reasoning as to why those interests either are going to be addressed or not, which I think helps move the needle towards more meaningful consultation. Thank you. And I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and ranking member and the witnesses for joining us today. Uh, we've heard time and time again uh, in this committee about the lack of effective consultation and collaboration between federal agencies and uh, tribal governments. As we address the health, economic, racial justice and climate crises, all of which disproportionately impact American Indians and Alaska Natives. We must ensure that those who are most impacted are at the decision-making table and engaged in meaningful ways. Sending an email to check off the box is just not enough. Uh, question for Mr. Uh, Matthew uh, Fletcher. 
Uh, can you explain why the Respect Act's protection of tribal treaty rights is an important contribution uh, to enforcing tribal consultation? I will do my best, sir. Thank you. Um, so treaty rights, uh, the, the first place to start is to acknowledge what it is that treaty rights do and what they mean to Indian people. So uh, I mentioned earlier that treaty rights often uh, create a homeland for Indian people. Uh, a homeland comes with a lot of things. It comes with land. It comes with access to resources. And those resources may be on or off reservation. It also includes um, an ongoing relationship with the United States. Um, that relationship could be the United States offering protection from outsiders that the United States provides to everybody in the United States. Um, it could also mean an ongoing relationship whenever the United States chooses to engage in an activity that implicates uh, the interests that tribes have that they've decided to seek to protect uh, in the treaties. Um, so some of those obligations are uh, implicit, and some of them are, uh, or some of the, the, some of those interests are implicit. To they're not explicitly stated. Some of the treaties are very short and abrupt. They say things like tribes shall have a reservation and they can have access to resources off the reservation and the United States will continue to provide services. So the tribes have, uh, have to have the opportunity to articulate what it is that their interests are. Um, in Michigan, we're very interested in the continuing uh, protection of the Great Lakes and the, the Great Lakes are not mentioned in the treaties. So we need to be able to have uh, the opportunity to communicate our interests to the federal government when and to the state of Michigan and other states when those interests are implicated. And that's what the RESPECT Act gives the opportunity to do. And uh, our committee is uh, very aware of the difficulties and the lag times that tribal governments experience in the federal government's disbursement of the uh, virus, uh, coronavirus relief funds last year, especially following the CARES Act passage. Uh, based on what you witnessed in 2020, how might the RESPECT Act have uh, expedited the disbursement and implementation of the virus relief funds? Well, I could easily see one way that tribes would have reached out to uh, or would have been asked by the Department of the Interior and Department of the Treasury on how CARES Act funds and other relief funds would have been dispersed uh, was to reach out and say, how do you want that uh, to be done? Uh, one way that tribes could have responded was, would be to say, we would like it uh, done analogously to um, how money is dispersed through the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, also known as uh, Public 38. So this is called 638 contracting. We tribes enter into annual funding agreements with the uh, various agencies in the United States every year. Um, it's a well-worn path that tribes like to use, and that could have been um, a, a jumping off point for a discussion. And there's so many cases that are pending right now, including one in the Supreme Court about what the Department of Treasury and Interior chose to do um, in terms of uh, where those funds go. There's also a case pending uh, where the uh, tribes are challenging the formula for how money is to be shared um, and distributed. So all of that could have been avoided through the, the, the RESPECT Act. Thank you. And in about 40 seconds, I have uh, Ms. Uh, Stacy Leeds. In your testimony, you described that there have been good efforts and some progress in deploying uh, consultation as a tool for implementing the federal trust responsibility. Can you highlight some of these examples and how can we replicate this on a broader scale? About 30 seconds you have. Yes, one of the things that's mentioned in the Respect Act draft that no one has spoken about so far is the trainings that are available, not just at the agency head level, but throughout the entire agency and not just Department of Interior, but all agencies. I think that goes a really long way. And then finally, one other piece of this, these consultations have to have a bilateral effect. We heard testimony from people who reached out and tried to get information or just updates from the federal government and just never heard back. And that includes tribal governments as well as individuals. So knowing that there's a, an agency lead and a point person where the tribe can be the initiator of communication instead of the other way around will um, make a, a very big difference. And that's possible under this act. 
Thank you. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Representative Garcia and Ms. Leeds. I want to thank each of the witnesses for their insightful testimony and the members for their questions, which added to the dialogue and will contribute uh, to our legislation. I am very pleased at the fact that we seem to have across the board support for the concepts underlining these three bills, which is education, um, protecting cultural patrimony, and, and protecting the other areas of where federal policy impacts uh, Native American tribal interests. Uh, I also want to make sure that, Mr. Gallegos, uh, uh, you are quite clear uh, and correct that it is very important to promote um, the Indian market and other matters of cultural uh, development of art and, and, and the work that so many of the artists provide, and that the STOP Act does uh, presume that uh, art made for cultural purposes is not covered by the STOP Act. Uh, and I will uh, make sure we provide you the two references, which is you can find at section 2A and section 3.3, that that kind of commercial art is not what is intended to be impacted uh, precisely because of the issues that you raise. So thank you for raising that and we'll give you that so you can be assured on that. Um, as I stated before, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you, uh, witnesses, to respond to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be open for 10 business days for these responses. If there is no further business, without objection, the sub subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you to each of you.